they had to mention the fucking Krenum, didn't they? And just give me a little nerd boner. And I was like, oh, I know who the Krenum are. <laughs> Captain's Pod, Stardate 1441, 94.1. Welcome aboard Starship Enterprise, and thank you for joining us as we take a brief short leave from the world of cinema sins to explore the universe of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. I'm your Captain mm-hmm. Ian Winterton, mm-hmm. and with me, as always, 10% of her understands how 5% of the trill works. It's Ambassador Danae. I like it. I like that so, so much. That is one of the hardest, genuinely hardest edits I had to do last week. Was making me sound smart? <laughs> No, no, it was making me not sound dumb. Um, what you heard last week of me explaining the the trill and the Adira and Grey situation, that was, I would say, at best 75% of the actual conversation that we had. I, I streamlined and I trimmed and I tried to frame it in a way that didn't have all of you screaming at your phones or your podcast player of choices saying, Ian, you dumbass, you're confusing the situation. Stop it. Well, I, listen, I hope it helped. I feel like people sometimes skip over the process of learning something because it is uncomfortable. Yes. But I feel like we arrived. I think so. We're also learning a completely made up thing. This this <laughs> isn't a thing that is under any obligation to science, physics, the universe to make sense because it is invented and it is fiction. So it's very strange to try and explain a fictional thing that I think I understand as scientifically as possible but i think we got there and i think we i hope we enjoyed the process i did i definitely thought about it a lot um i've carried around a child inside of my body before so i feel like i have an understanding of what a worm would potentially feel like in this marsupial (laughs) pocket but the difference i can't wait i can't wait for iris to be old enough (laughs) hey remember that time your mum described you as a worm it was a pretty hefty looking worm when it popped into that soup stuff yeah they're a parasite they actually are but the part that I don't know about is giving over my consciousness and maybe Mm, taking a back mm -hmm. seat. I don't think I would enjoy that too much. I feel like at this point in my life, I'm confidently aware that I like to be in control. Yeah. And there would be an element, I guess for me, it would be like, well, I'm the option. You're going to die anyway. So it's like, I'm either dead to the universe or a piece of me lives on in the next host. So it's not that I'm giving up anything. It's that I'm continuing on. But the way that the doctor form. guy described it last episode was that he was like present but not present. Exactly. And yes. I don't I don't think I would enjoy that. Like you literally are taking kind of a backseat to this parasite's life. Well, it's either that or oblivion. Just nothing. Assuming you don't believe in an afterlife of some sort. <laughs> there's still so much, I think, I guess I guess there's a lot left to figure out in the trill department. And I don't know if mm. there's canon. Does the host and the parasite do they have conversations subconsciously when they're making choices about what sort no. of take out to, to have? It's just the tr- the the, the worm one is fully in. They're one being my ass. They are one being. They are integrated. No, they're not. They are one being. No, because the guy said he was kind of taking a back seat. Oh, Didn't I don't want to do I don't know that Didn't I want to do Yeah, but so Janal Bix is taking a back seat in what becomes the next Bix. No, I'm so, talking about the doctor who hosted the consciousness. Oh, what, Dr. Cole? Yeah, yeah. Last yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, because this is totally different. Oh, this is a totally right. different ceremony. Gotcha. He's not having the worm. Uh, He's having that's true. another personality. Okay, put okay, in his okay, brain. okay. Yeah, totally yeah. different. Yeah, I think in that case, I'd do it then. If it wasn't like me taking a back seat and it was more of a unified, yeah, you're in it. Yeah, yeah, you're a unified, unified thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would do it in a second to have that 600 years or whatever of power. I just, I'd hate to be the first one. I'd hate to be the first, because then you're getting like no benefit. Like the first. The, the the baby worm yeah. it gets its first host 100%. and like the host is like let's go and it's like oh you have no fucking memories at all you are you're new i have nothing great everyone else benefits from me being awesome it's like avatar the airbender when when i first watched that series and you get to see ang there and then the first time that you get to kind of see like the previous avatar and then it's like this whole chain of them that came before and the the one at the very beginning is just this little tiny dot in the distance do you know what I'm I saying? I haven't watched this. Sh- I haven't watched this. Sh- I know, obviously know of it, but I've never mean? seen I Avatar. Watch this. No, I've never seen it. You- you're describing the trill. Holy shit. Oh, we need to watch Avatar now. Oh, fuck yeah, it's great. Okay, well, before we're going to go watch some Avatar, but before that, let's head over to the Observation Lounge 
and do some do some predictions Ooh, and emails. I like it. Let's go there instead. I am so excited. Number one, there's carpeting. You know, mm-hmm. no, I'm the captain, not number one. Oh yeah. <laughs> Star Trek dad jokes. Emails. Okay, hailing frequencies open, everyone, and welcome to the Observation Lounge. It's time for us to read your emails and predictions from Twitter, Discord, and well, email. So take up a plushy chair. We have a new desk. Don't mind the dust. We haven't. This room has been here the entire time for the whole three years we've been doing this show, but we haven't used it, so it's a little bit musty. Gross. Yeah, space it's gross. must. Space must. Ugh. Or there shouldn't actually be any must? must in it. No, must. Musk, not must. Must. Musty? Musky. It must yeah. be musky. Okay, we have a couple of predictions before we go on and do our predictions for um, Discovery Season 5, Episode 4, Face the Strange. Um, I really like this one. This is from Phil on the Discords. Lack of luck and mole, 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 and, mole and lock, stock and barrel, mole, luck, is a breen. Now, the reason I think that's really fun is because we've never seen what the Breen look like. So the Breen are this alien species in Deep Space Nine, and they always have a helmet on. We never, ever see them without a helmet. And they work with the Dominion, we're at war with them, and it's always been, what's under that fucking helmet? Now, some of the books have delved into it, but this is just a really obscure, nice little pull, um, if like happens to be a breen although I, I don't know if i would be a little bit disappointed that he's a kind of standard alien i kind of wanted something funky underneath that helmet i just decided to read up on it on wikipedia mm. i see if wikipedia does a better job of explaining the breen than i do explaining the trill well i don't really know how much time you want to invest in it but this part was something that i was reading the look of the breen masks which included a snout was derived from the visual suggestion that they are a snouted species, like an arctic Mm. wolf. The Breen costumes were problematic for the actors playing them since they made both seeing and breathing difficult. (laughs) (laughs) You know, tiny little biological functions. There was only a single small hole in the beak, (laughs) about eight inches from the actor's nose, according to the stand-in and and, uh, stunt double Todd Slayton, who played Thought Gore. The costumes also included big, clumsy boots, and the outfits were layered like an armadillo, making movement difficult. The helmets were great. The rest of it looked shit. (laughs) The helmets, which were complicated to put on and remove, were held together with magnets and were prone to falling off when someone bumped into them. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Why have I never seen that blooper? The switches for the lights on the helmets were inside the helmet, requiring the actor to remove the helmet to turn the lights on and off. For reasons unknown to production personnel, the 9-volt batteries that power the lights only lasted minutes. I mean, I thought you were going to say they had to switch them on and off with their tongue. Oh my god, imagine it. (laughs) It would be incredible. The only breathing hole is 8 inches from the nose. Yeah. That's a lot of space to just be getting the the in and out of the last breath. I now completely understand why we didn't see them on screen very much. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. You're getting the mask. You've been a naughty boy this week. You're getting in the mask. But I do see the picture on the Wikipedia page, Mm. and I can kind of see some of the similarities. One of the things that stood out from that first episode was that their costuming was like the darker costuming, and it had like really interesting lights on the helmets and such. So I would be interested. I don't remember if the lights were green, but this particular picture has that kind of green lighting. So maybe it is like a little wink and nod. It's very cool. I would love it. What the the books dive in, obviously the books don't matter, but the reason that the Breen had a helmet was because they were actually a mix of several different species and they didn't want anybody to know that. They mm. wanted to be known as just the Breen. Interesting. That's super interesting. But yeah. Well, and when he took his helmet off, he seemed to morph a little bit. Yeah. And so like maybe the, the that's... Force. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's kind uh-huh. of part of it is that there's just this... Know. Like, unknown origin vibe to him yeah i want to know more about him he's very interesting well thanks for that one phil um we have a this is kind of a combined prediction from wandering winder and nick jagged who both kind of came at this from a similar angle as like an overarching prediction for the season that because of timey wimey shenanigans discovery will actually get sent back to the past but way, way, way in the past. And they'll find the technology and end up being the ones that seed the universe, the galaxy, 
with the life that creates humans, Klingons, Romulans, and they end up being the progenitors as like a bootstrap paradox continuation thing. And that will be how Discovery ends its journey. Very It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious to see where this goes because it's not just a seasonal arc. It's Mm -hmm. a series arc. So yeah, they're probably going to be inclined to try to give the whole show a depth of purpose by the end. Yes. That kind of canonizes what Discovery can do for the franchise. So something Mm. big and epic like that is definitely on the table. Uh, And I can't remember exactly who. It may have been wondering, but someone else predicted, and I really, really like this, that we it would be kind of beautiful if if Ethan Peck's um, Spock appeared at some point, because as far as he knows, his sister is dead and the crew of the Discovery died. To give a kind of full circle moment, it would be nice if Burnham had the opportunity to interact with her brother one last time and just say, I'm okay, I didn't die. I ended up leading this incredible life in the future. So some kind of time traveliness would be cool to bring, kind of bring them back together and give them a moment as well. It'd be really fun. If they did do that, though, it, would it make sense that Spock would never mention that closure for the rest of his life? Oh, I, I mean, yes. I mean, he never mentioned Cyborg. Uh, things are never mentioned. Like there are entire species in Enterprise that should be in TNG but are never mentioned don't show up for whatever reason. I think the universe is big enough where you can you can find ways to explain it away, especially with Vulcans who aren't prone to oversharing unless there's a reason to share. Yeah, they're definitely not based on an American who just talks no. about themselves nonstop. Oh, did I tell you about that cool thing that I bought at the store the other day? No. That was just an example so. of me being an American. Oh, <laughs> Forgive me, like I didn't even blink. It's like she's gonna derail the show and we're gonna talk about something for a minute that I'm gonna have to edit into the outtakes. Didn't even blink because like, let's just let it happen. Um some episode specific predictions. Um we have from wondering, um, facing the strange will require, and I really like this, a rejection of um accepted science. So the the metaphor behind face the strange will be Burnham having to understand that there are things beyond Starfleet's knowledge and beyond what current science understands and she has to expand her knowledge or her like acceptance of what is real to accept this strange new thing that is brought to them which kind of ties into this advanced technology that could look like magic compared to um the current state of starfleet science i like that as a as a metaphor i can see the show setting it up for that this quest for understanding depth and meaning and Oftentimes a show won't define that by the end because they don't want to be that presumptuous to know. Mm -hmm. And this is a big one to kind of be poking on the beginning of everything. So I can see them. Oh, it's pretty huge. Yeah, I can see them blending that out and saying, we don't really know. It's complicated. It's different. And asking us to expand our mind. I can definitely see that. And plus the idea that the Jax to Bax Bax wormy guy last time said that he wanted to see that we weren't going to be using this weapon mm. based on like a lack of understanding of different creatures and and showing more of a yeah. grace and understanding towards the An cicadas etc yeah mm. so i can see that being a theme man thinking about that it's really bold because this is like this is star trek outright saying god didn't do it science did it <laughs> when it comes to seeding the planet unless i mean you could always say that the interpretation of God is the progenitors, and mm-hmm. that is what became the multiple hundreds of religions throughout the throughout the planet. But either way, it's a bold thing to to take on, uh, almost as bold as taking on an episode of TNG. Almost TNG is my holy text. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about what you're saying, you know, about like saying it's not God, it's science. But I, if they are going to go in this direction, I think that they would say that sometimes science can be considered God. Yeah, exactly. From, depending on your point of view. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. And it's a very Star Trek way to look at it as well. Um, so, Ambassador, any predictions before we dive into the episode for Face the Strange? The crew is on their way to Zankethi space, um, but have been paused due to some bureaucratic red tape. For this episode specifically, I think we're going to be honing in on the uh, captain and the first officer relationship because we didn't really get that last episode so that's mm-hmm. really the strongest kind of prediction i have is that that's going to take more of a central theme in this episode 
Um, and then, of course, we're going to get another clue. So those are kind of some easy things to sort of guess. Um, and I'm also expecting that this Booker character or book character mm-hmm. is going to reveal more information about his connection to this sister-like character uh, in Molly Mock. Mm, Molly Mock. Whatever Aww. her name is. Oh, Molly Mock. It's Mall. I miss Molly Mock. Um, there is a quick thing I want to say about Booker that will help you should they dive in. So Book is a courier, which in this kind of time frame of the 3200s, um, is basically like a mercenary of sorts, and they do their jobs for hire. And he was mentored by a person called Cleveland Booker, and at a certain point he took on that name when his mentor died, and Moll is this guy's actual daughter. So they're not biological brother and sister. It's more of a, we had the same father figure kind of thing. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that Cleveland Booker isn't his real name. It's a title or a moniker that's handed down to the next courier. And it's also interesting that Molly Mock knows this. She's, when that Mm, name is mentioned, there's no question in her mind as to who she's working with against at this point yes yeah so maybe in this episode two the divulgence or the digging into of that relationship will kind of show us more about lock shock and barrel Mm -hmm. i'm really i'm really hoping that the audience at home isn't so annoyed with me using the wrong names because it's just it's a lot to keep track of you if you've heard me in, in previous seasons you'll know that by the last episode i'll get it yeah, she'll absolutely get it. And the problem is, there are, for me, I don't know if it's just an English, uh, the way my English throat is put together, lack and moll are really hard to say because I want to say lack and moll, but that's not how the American pronunciation is on the show. So it's so, it's so just, they're, they're difficult names, people. They're hard and they just put apostrophes everywhere. Well, my prediction is that we're finally going to get to see the Zankethi and Face the Strange re- um, refers to um, Burnham and the crew's uh, willingness as part of the test of this puzzle to face something they're completely unfamiliar with, which will be this new species, accept how they do things differently, make a bond with them, and only when their two peoples combine will they get the new piece of the puzzle. However... The Zankethi will eventually betray them because Locke and Mal got there first and they made a deal with the Zankethi and they will be betrayed. That's your prediction? Yeah. Bold prediction. That's That'll make a fun episode, right? That's like an entire yeah, that's like a whole episode. <laughs> that's where I'm going. Okay, with that, let's get out of the observation lounge, head over to the holodeck, and watch the episode. We'll see you in turn forward for a full debrief. Two to be met. Welcome to Ten Forward, the part of the show where we grab something from the replicator and share our immediate thoughts and feelings on the episode we just watched together. Most important question first, what would you like from the uh, programmable matter dispenser? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's something that can de-age one particular part of my body? What, like, what's uh, mm, Earl Grey? Depends on, <laughs> depends on which part of your body you're de-aging. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. digits specifically digits <laughs> just yeah. your fingers yeah you know what yeah. you know what while my hand is fucked up i'm just gonna grab a hot tea that's what it is that's what it is oh, i'm yeah, gonna use to my nothing my hands to already messed up yeah. so i want to have a linus because he was stuck in the replicator and i want to have whatever he ordered that was so good that that he got stuck in there to grab it you know it was a th- throwaway line i it was a throwaway line but i don't in my mind i wasn't thinking replicator i was thinking about the like the beaming pad or whatever oh the transporter yeah in my head oh, that's what he i got heard stuck in there but it's oh. not it was the replicator yeah he got stuck in the replicator how do you get stuck in a replicator right it must be really tasty that you just like i imagine he got his head stuck in there like, nom 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 oh my so god you I, I, you probably wouldn't know this but linus is the tall alien with the big black yeah, eyes. He's the frog. Yeah. The froggy guy. The frog looking guy. Yeah. yeah the yeah. Burnham meets the amphibian. I love that moment so much when he was just like, red suits you. And she's so sincere. She's like, thank you, Linus. I pre- <laughs> Linus is incredible. He's a great character. I feel like Linus is the character that kind of gets shit on a little bit because maybe like the Neelix of the Discovery 
and I'm picking that up from the live chat. So I might be mm. completely off base here, but every once in a while there's like a little f- influx of Linus shenanigans. No, people kind of hate Neelix um, and they love Linus pretty oh, universally. Okay. Like okay, Linus okay. is just, ad- he's he tends to be the butt of the joke, but he also kind of comes in clutch sometimes. Like he sometimes has the solution, but we never really see him. He will say like a couple of lines and then be mentioned off screen, just like, oh yeah, Linus came up with this idea. But, He's just like in the background. But doesn't Neelix solve problems too, or does he create them? Am I no, wrong? No, he creates the oh, problems okay. and then pontificates about them and then poisons people with cheese. Um, let's have a synopsis, Ambassador. Oh, uh, in today's episode, we return to last season of Captain's Pod with the timey-wimey shenanigans theme. That's yes, right. That's right. We did. We accidentally could have watched this in the past somehow if you can travel into the future would have been per- oh is that your synopsis that's, you done? that's the synopsis <laughs> <laughs> this week it's a time travel episode they get stuck in a in a cause and effect relativity shattered um situation I'll, where I'll, like, I'll, I'll, yeah yeah this episode has happened in voyager where they revisit previous episodes of the show yeah. because of time shenanigans let me take an actual stab at it the episode today is uh Lock, Shock, and Barrel have have sent a time bug into the Discovery ship, which heads to engineering, attaches to something, and it's meant to essentially trap them in a time loop for a series of days or months or however long it lasts in order to get mm-hmm. an edge on them and get to the progenitor weapon before they do. It's and the most so, convoluted way to do it. I, so, I cannot think of a more yeah. complicated way to trap someone. So in this episode, you have the captain and the first officer repeating, not repeating, but getting kind of like moved through time and attempting mm-hmm. to figure out how to get out of it because one of their moves through time sends them into the future where they realize that everything is super fucked. And if they yeah. don't get out of it, then everything goes to shit. And so will they, with the power of friendship, save the day? By God, they will. Oh, and Basically. Mm-hmm. we get to take a nice little Rolodex run through the history of Discovery at key moments. Uh, yes. So for anyone who's been watching Discovery, we're going to revisit things in the past. And for anyone who's new to Discovery, we're watching things that we don't really care about. But that's okay, because it kind of gives <laughs> us a little bit of like a... a Tiny little like, sprinklings of context. Yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of like when you walk into a building and they have pictures of all of the things that it looked like before you got there. And you, yeah. you kind of go, oh, yeah. that's neat. You you know, this is different. Or, wow, that's cool. And there's always that one person that's been with the company for like 30 years and is in the very first picture. Yes. And then there's the one who's not in any of the other pictures and you wonder what happened to them and it turns out they died. Yes. That's, that's, oh, shit. Yeah, that happened too. So many questions. Overall, thoughts and feelings, Ambassador. Did you like the episode? Um, Yeah. How was it for you? Well, I know that we sometimes do predictions in the beginning, the middle, or the end, but this yeah, one... Yeah, we need not bothered for this one. This one, definitely, I predicted it. Like, this is an episode that is designed to sort of solidify yeah. the crew in a really unique way. I loved this episode. I had a really good time. Me too. I don't, um, I don't know that come, I was trying to, but it happened. It will come as a surprise to nobody that I loved the shit out of this episode. It might be my favorite Discovery episode ever, because... And this is because, but it's it's really unfair because my other favorite Discovery episode is another time loop episode that they do. And this one and that one are basically, I, I would argue, the only episodes of Discovery that work as bottle episodes. And they kind of just, they don't progress the arc of the season very much. They just do their own thing inside of an episode. Yes, this has relational stuff between Burnham and Rayner and the crew that progress forward. But this is very much we're at the same place that we began, quite literally, at the beginning of the episode compared to the end of the episode. Like, we haven't really progressed anywhere. But I had so much fun because it does time travel shenanigans. It it puts them into some really interesting positions. They have some fun tech stuff that they have to do. Um, there's fun shenanigans going on around the ship. I just really, really had a good time. It's paced really, really well. Yes, the science is nonsense, but I had so much fun with it because it was really episodic. Mm. And I didn't feel any kind of like dragging thing. They have their own internal mystery to do within this episode that's completely separate to the overarching mystery. Yeah, I I had a blast. I did 
expect that we were going to be getting into like Booker's relationship to Maul, but that didn't happen this episode. In fact, this episode really mm. didn't spend much time on Maul and Locke at all. Um, except for the guess at the very beginning. So I can't say it all because at the very beginning we see yeah. them doing like murdering someone. So I'm mm-hmm. kind of intrigued in a way because when like they straight up murder someone. Um, so I think that they're really wanting to establish a couple of things. One, they're bad guys. They're really bad guys. And two, uh, that they are in love, which has been mm. assumed, but we actually see that on screen. Oh, I think we've seen them kiss Did in we? episode one. Yeah, they kissed for oh, sure. I don't think I remember that. But yeah. either way, so we kind of have those things. Are they going to go for the redeemable arc here? Maybe with Booker's relationship. But Booker was only in this in a flashback. I liked this as a, a completely out of context because I sort of got to see what the writers felt were the important moments for the mm. discovery. Well, that was my number one question, was this isn't just, like, time travel, time loop stuff. This is this is one of those episodes that often happens in Star Trek where it's almost a victory lap of some key plot moments. How did that affect your enjoyment of it, having not seen anything that they're referring to? Yeah. I Well, and that's the other thing. And th- they, what they didn't do, I also thought that they were going to be getting another clue to the mystery, and that didn't happen at all. Like, like we got... No? We, we didn't make progress as far as what the seasonal arc is telling us Mm -hmm. but what we did do is establish the relationships with the with with the crew and then maybe this was the hits for the the person who loves discovery and yeah was there a place for me in it i I mean i think so i enjoyed it because what we were seeing wasn't so removed from anything that my brain could like make the connections to it wasn't so complicated that i had to stop and say I am so lost because it was clear what was happening. We are traveling through points in time and we're doing that because these two people happen to beam at the wrong slash right moment. And so they are also outside of time. You've got the captain and the first Mm -hmm. officer that can sort of figure out the clues to this puzzle. And even though I have no relationship with Paul, I clearly understand now that at some point in time he was fungified and that gave him an ability to exist slightly outside of time and be Mm. able to sort of be another person or a participant that's outside of this loop they're not stuck there and yeah i I like that they didn't have to spend a lot of time doing it the episode spends most of its time like moving forward as a person while reflecting on the past and it was a Mm. really interesting way to do it even with the juxtaposition of michael versus michael i have no relationship with old michael i've never seen this character before but there was so much in that moment that i understood like she was a fighter she had a lot more to lose she wasn't like kind of by the books as much as she was a feral cat and then it was like This feral Michael versus this highly skilled and has a lot to lose because her crew is her like her life now person. And it was really interesting to see the fight versus the fight. I wasn't distracted by it at all. Mm -hmm. I was interested to go. In fact, at the very beginning, I thought, okay, does so can she Vulcan grip? Like, was she taught that? (laughs) Is that just save for Vulcans? Picard knows how to do it. Um, Picard called it. So we know that we know that he can. I forgot that. Non-Vulcans can. Can use the Vulcan death grip. Yeah. Tell me more. Death grip, nerve pinch. Stop it. No, you know it's the plexus. The, the what do you call it? The chop. <laughs> the thing we've talked about this on the show before. There is a one is chop knockout all it is? thing. Is it's just yeah, accessing that's all it is. that? It's okay, a focus. Okay. It's right. a focus nerve cluster that also yeah. it's made up. It's not real. But yes, in Star Trek, it's a nerve cluster thing that you can learn to do. Yeah. But it was really cool, and it was also interesting that we just touch a little bit on the Booker thing too. This moment where Mike, like our captain, has to. Play play into past relationships and we didn't have to be in it very long and i got to see this booker character as this supportive love interest rather than this convoluted been through a lot of shit person that i've just recently been introduced to and i also thought they did a great job with paul because when michael and um rayner yes Mm -hmm. eventually get to paul paul's like yep i really haven't had a chance to solve the problem because i've been trying not to break any time timey wiminess like he's sort of stuck in engineering and it was just a fun little statement that gave me all the context i needed for what his life has been like it's so interesting because 
uh, Burnham and Rainer are in addition to. They are moving through time. But Stamets is taking the place of himself and it's merging those two time travel concepts of do I inhabit my own body when I time travel or am I in addition to? So I don't think I've seen an episode of anything take those two concepts and do them at the same time. Yeah. And he's kind of like, because he doesn't know what's going on, he's like, I need to carry on doing the things that I was doing to the best of my ability just in case this fucks up the timeline. And when they figure out the the bug isn't really affecting the timeline he has a bit more freedom but i i love that so much and it was a nice little callback to stamets's origins as yeah. well with the tardigrade dna and yeah. just the dna is uh, dna discovery yes, is very res- <laughs> hi <laughs> discovery is very respectful of its own canon i think it it doesn't like to forget things it likes to be like yeah we might be kind of parallel to star trek a little bit with some of the things we're doing but internally we try to stay very cons- consistent um yeah and it, it's perfect to have stamets in this episode because he was the key of the last time loop episode as oh, well interesting. where his tardigrade dna let him be the only one that was aware that discovery was in a self-repeating time loop and he had to groundhog day his way to a solution so it was it would have been very odd had he not been part of the solution here as well so i i really yeah enjoy that. but that's the kind of perspective that you're gonna you know have having watched discovery that mm. i'm going to be lacking where i was really enjoying that the first officer kind of got where he needs to be to be a part of the crew in this really interesting way you know uh, and yeah. the writers are going to write it how they want to write it and it felt maybe a little bit forced but at the same time the stakes were really high and he knew it and maybe he's faking it. Maybe he's faking a sense of camaraderie to accomplish his goals. And that's okay. And maybe he'll snap. <laughs> that's that's fine. And revert because, back to his yeah. norm. Oh, I'm fully expecting it. Can I give you a prediction early? Go for it. There's a moment whenever he um like he's like, Hey, we need to we need to take our bio reading out of this computer system. Mm-hmm. And she's like, Oh yeah, we can do that. And she punches in a code and does it right in front of him and he goes, Thanks. I think he's paying attention to that code. Oh, I, I mean, think he's going to go for me. I will send the shit out of that. I, I will send uh, the heck out I'm of just saying, it. I'm just saying. It seems like, a little to a, me. There is a great line where he's like, uh, uh, Burnham's like, well, we need to do it my way. This is my ship. And he's like, even if my way is better. Like, I do feel like there is a point coming where Captain Rayner is still obviously inside of him. And he's like, my way is better. And he's going to be so arrogant that he'll overrule Burnham and pull some shit like yes. that and, and try and take command of Discovery. Yeah. Absolutely. Although the code should not be that easy to... It shouldn't just be code. Yeah, it should be biometrics. I understand anyway. that. But I think that there's something coming down the line with this with this character because it was a little bit... And I'm curious what's going to happen, but there's a mm. little bit happening in the writing here where he shifts. And I think he's shifting in a strategic yeah. fashion. And whether or not it's for nefarious reasons or not, I think he is going to be affected by this more relational approach and i thought that the end of the episode where michael kind of like expands on yes being in a relationship does compromise you a little bit but we have learned a way to be very honest with each other Mm. so that we can still you know move forward and as someone who's pretty blunt with my team i appreciate that a lot like i love when i can just be really blunt and say what i'm thinking and not worry at the end that there's going to be some fallout in my personal life and with my working team. It's just a powerful place to be. So if this is sort of what they're saying is like relationally we're close. I want to listen. I want to make sure everyone has an ear at the table. And it leads to greatness mixed with Rainer's. Yeah, we ain't got time for that shit. And I appreciate that too. There's like mm-hmm. a little balance that I think they're going to find here. And this episode gets us there in a really interesting way. I'm going to use ear at the table rather than seat at the table going Did forwards. Did I say ear at the table? Because I want you, you, you're all welcome at the table as long as you're listening and not talking. Oh, I like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's I like much that. how I would like to lead. You I, can have an ear yeah, at my table, yeah. but not a mouth. Ears, seats, butts, whatever it is. Amazing. Yeah, so so yeah, I, it was really, a, really an interesting kind of like uh, take, I think, today. Yeah, I'm with you. And I was, I was conflicted and... You've summed it up pretty much the same way that I feel, and that and that we have sped at warp nine through Rainer's 
adjustment to this crew and the show is getting him to exactly where he needs to be for us to enjoy him being Burnham's number one and we, we like our people to to get along and stuff so it does there is an element of it that feels like we are rushing him to a place where he can mold into this crew not be a pain in the ass and be one of us which the rushness is frustrating however i couldn't help but enjoy it in this yeah. episode yeah because it's woven into a really interesting story a really interesting adventure and with some impetus behind how he has to adapt the stakes are so so high he no- he has this glimpse into the future where zora has told them you fail you fucked up so that moment that comes immediately after that with stamets and engineering when he's like okay, I've got to try something here. Let's put my ego to one side and try and do it his way because we have eight minutes to do this. And the final conversation with uh, season one Burnham where he has to dig in and do that, it shows that he's really practical and I love that he's using empathy as a tool. Like you said, even if he doesn't double down on it and he hasn't naturally evolved he's still rainer underneath but now he's yeah. using the tools around yes. him to get what he wants and i really really like, I like that, that too. that's really clever and it makes sense he is having yeah. to adapt to a new crew and i am hoping that the writers are intentionally doing this because yeah it feels speedy but it makes sense that mm-hmm. rainer has now seen a practical application of how michael's approach to being a captain yes works for this crew so he's going to take this skill set and adapt it to get the crew to do what he wants them to do Mm. and you know there's this kind of quote-unquote payoff and it was a little like maybe not quite the payoff that i was i didn't feel it in my being in the end scene when we have rainer that's talking to old michael and yeah the what's his name stamets maybe the engineer it's the the two people. Uh, Michael comes. Old Michael comes in with another person to stop them from oh, going to work. The, the guy that likes ships. Yes. And he's like, he's saying, "You like the Constitution class because you like the curves and whatnot." Yeah, the tactical right. officer. So tactical officer, I think. This is this is coming off of the one statement that he was given in that forty-five second interview from yeah. the previous episode, and so this is the payoff of him kind of proving I paid attention enough to regurgitate this information. And yes. but he's manipulative enough that he can deliver it in a way that makes it seem like he knows more about them. But had this moment been able to play yeah. out for 20 minutes, it's going to be pretty obvious that there's no depth to that relationship. He just happens to give a fact in a way that gives them the slightest pause where he really ramps into a believable character for me is when he steps to the gun, looks mm. Michael in the eye and uses, again, the little bit of information he's been given to manipulate the situation to his tactical advantage that's the interesting part of the character is are the writers intentionally developing the character like this i hope so because it's working (sighs) for me it's yeah the tng way of doing this he reminds me of jellico so much who were who had to take command of the enterprise for a two-parter and he's very much this hard ass i'm not going to be friends with anybody you do it my way and he like changes the shift, shift rotations just to be a dick. And he puts everybody to work because he's like, I don't care. You all should be in uniform, lick my boots. That's fine. Rainer is beginning to feel a bit more nuanced where he's not, it's my way or the highway because that's how I lead. It's my way or the highway and then I'm going to adapt a little bit to manipulate you. I hope he is being really manipulative and me not too. just this. this kind of me too. Oh, I found my soul. Because yeah, no. One of my favorite lines early on in this episode is when he mentions the burn. Now, when, when like, uh, we mentioned this a couple of episodes, but when Discovery gets to the 32nd century, there are no warp capable ships. And essentially, an event happened a few hundred years earlier that detonated all of the dilithium um, in the in the galaxy, basically. So warp travel was no longer possible. So he has grown up and they've only got back warp travel since two seasons ago so they've only had it for a couple of years he's lived his entire life in a world that didn't really have much of a starfleet it didn't have a federation this guy is traumatized by uh the the difficult life that he's had to leave without warp drive without the same ships and technology that burnham and crew have had so this is the difference between leading in wartime and leading in peacetime and he's very much a war leader and that that 
totally makes sense. It does. And that's why I'm hoping that the, they're not going, oh, he's grown a heart. It's more like, oh, he is being really tactical and he's being heartfelt tactical. He's going to play mm. a part. And I hope that they're doing that. And I don't really care. It's working for him. Yeah. It works. And I think it works for this episode, too. I do think he does respect Michael in a way. I think like he's impressed with no, her. No, I think that's genuine. Yeah. When, when she has to go back as a captain of the ship. Now, I'm missing a ton of context here. Oh, I am dying to fill you in, but I'm I'm waiting until prompted. Bullet point me because I don't think I <laughs> yeah, need huh. it. That no. scene no, 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 you really didn't. on the bridge between our captain and the old crew gave me... Yeah so much information about how mm-hmm. people perceived her at this time and also yeah, huh? props to the con like the like the costuming I-, I was never confused about where i was every scene was really interesting like you've got this the the room that they were kind of popping in and out of is changing in really interesting ways and then but that that scene where she steps on board uh, on the bridge with the- these people like when they're like tilly i'm like okay cool tilly's there and I kind of went mm-hmm. in in this sort of like not realizing how heavy it was, but then the acting and the writing took me there quickly. I was yeah, like, that's oh, really great. she's, she was kind of hated. Oh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear I that miss? you picked up on all of that. I think they did a, I think they did a great job, but it's interesting to hear you who literally haven't seen it. You are the rainer in this episode. You've really they've managed to communicate really well what happened it is kind of wild the journey that michael has been on and how this crew has developed and evolved so super duper quickly michael did some shit in the first episode of discovery um got tried for mutiny because she kind of her actions instigated this war with the klingons she got her captain killed and because she thought she was doing what was right um Michael ends up back on the ship, but it's very, very tense because she's a mutineer. Nobody thinks she deserves to be there. Saru is like, get off my ship. You should Whoa. not be here. Okay. They do not get on. And eventually, like, she proves herself. They rely on her. Long, 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 long road getting from there to here. She ends up being captain again. Um, so, but yeah, she's a mutineer. They do not like her. They don't think she should be in uniform. So Discovery, the show, and as it as a whole is about the ship it's not about the captain of the ship or is um, it or is it about michael it's really about michael okay. this should have been, it's really her journey yeah they just named it after the ship because that's where you spend most of your time okay so what was she doing when she was on the ship and she wasn't captain was she like just like an engineer person or science officer i believe if i remember rightly i'm pretty sure she was a science officer and it eventually becomes saru's first officer um, and then they eventually shoehorn her into the captain's seat. I think what was really interesting to me in that final scene, which might be my favorite one, is that they were offended by the thought that she would be captain. It wasn't just like a, oh, oh what a, uh-huh. it wasn't like a yeah. whatever. It was like, fuck you. How can a mutineer do Yeah, that, this goes against everything that I'm doing if a mutineer can be captain. And then, and I, this is something maybe you can kind of speak to, this this android that's in the in the captain's chair in this moment um yeah that that Arium. what is it Arium. Arium is uh obviously a very respected character um mm. and i wonder if this is the show taking a moment to respect this character nodding back to when they were more of an active part of the show and i think it's important sometimes to kind of go this is like the the end of the series so what a great moment to bring back but also that this android's sacrifice wasn't a glitch it wasn't a mistake it was a choice Mm. and it was one that they would make and what was interesting is that they chose to show us that none of the characters would have believed that they did this that they could do this that they would do this but then the character itself says no i i would do that and it seemed like michael might be the only one that would know that truth which was kind of the key to everyone maybe believing that michael was from the future and was the captain Mm -hmm. and how did that hit for you because for me it's like oh that's interesting but for you having like known this character and seen this character was that like a question about this sacrifice in that early season was this like answering a question or not really because arium wasn't she wasn't like data or even geordie or even like chief o'brien she's not 
in every episode. She would pop up. She would have answers. She was definitely part of the bridge crew. But I didn't feel super, super connected to her when she um, when she died. The episode where she does die, which I think is in season two, it is really profound because she makes this big sacrifice. And it's kind of like, I've got a catch-22 choice here. This is a really tough decision, but I've got to do it. And it's a decision that no one's going to make for me. I have to sacrifice myself to make sure this is going to work. And Arium isn't an android. She is actually a human woman, but was in a huge accident that killed her husband. And she's been mostly replaced with cybernetic parts. So you can see like her mouth, eyes, and lips and stuff. They were all human. She is a human under there, but she's like 75% cybernetically replaced um it was a really interesting moment and i think a really clever way to bring arian back and give her another moment and to give it does actually give that death more impact yeah knowing that her in front of burning was like oh yeah for sure i would do that that's yeah that's exactly what i would do it's very interesting it is interesting um it does feel a little bit quote-unquote cheaty and i i'm curious how you feel about this being someone who loves time episodes and timey wiminess and all this stuff because they do go through a quite a lot of of uh lifting for the explanation about how time works moment oh we gotta love it (laughs) there are this bug works exactly how it needs to work to not work (laughs) yeah and then this shield works and here's how we're going to fix that problem that we just invented by doing this other thing which makes us have to do this other thing I kind of love it. It's so TNG. It's so, so TNG. This highly specific bit of sabotage that works just exactly how it needs to work. And what the things that this bug... We're definitely getting into sins here, but the things that this bug can do that are so impressive and yet can be undermined so specifically as well is just impressive. This is technology that is insane and yet has this very specific loophole that they're able to to exploit and take advantage of well this is my point like at this point so we we can kind of talk about how the time works in this entire episode but specifically in the moment leading up to this bridge scene which is kind of where we are in the time in our in, in like where we're at in the episode right now they essentially describe that they have to do this warp pop out of the warp make a bubble Time does some Breaks shit, which yeah. lets you put your hand into the dangerous place and capture the bug. But also, it means, and instantly we know this, that this timeline won't exist anymore. So they kind of throw all of these <sighs> rules that we usually have in place for episodes like this or movies like this, where you can't see yourself, you can't talk about what you're doing, and because it's going to just disappear. Um, and so... Essentially, the crew is not only accepting that Michael is who she says she is from the future, that they Mm -hmm. have to go to warp and bop out and possibly ruin themselves, but they're also maybe coming to terms with in their own mental calculations that they're going to not exist very shortly. They don't say that out loud on the bridge, yeah. but they're the way version of them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like. There's a moment when the Tignataro character is like, are you in a time loop? Which Oh, it was so great. It was so I great. loved it so Which, much. Technically, he wasn't in a time loop, so he got no. to say no. But my point is, is that these characters are used to these possibilities. So yes. you know that they're doing these mental calculations. Oh, so you've got so like great. old school Tilly and these great characters who are questioning Michael. And then suddenly Android, partial Android lady is like, we're doing this time warp thing. You know they're back there going, wait a second, we're breaking all of our rules. Does that mean mm-hmm. that I'm not going to exist anymore? And where does their agency come into play? Like, yeah. So this is happening after the timey-wimey explanation. And I'm just wondering, like, did all of this work for you? For me, I just sit back and I'm like, what the fuck ever? Don't even tell me what's in the drink. I'm just going to drink it because it looks delicious. It was, if this this all hinges on how much fun I had and how much I enjoyed the episode. My acceptance of all of your time travel bullshit is directly proportional to how much fun I had. If I didn't yeah. have fun, I'm going to tear it apart. Okay. If I had fun, I'll forgive a lot. They And they go to a lot of effort of explaining things. So she does say, I need to wipe my biosignature from the ship. Because like even that. the fact that the ship detected me here Technically, could violate the it. timeline. 
he said he said that. whoever said the show said it and, and i was when, really happy with that's that that's when the code was that's put when in the code thing way. happened yeah i love the effort that went into that i love that stamets is there to to give the rundown of how this loop is different from the previous not loops this this um jump in time is different from the previous jumps in time and if we do this the effects only set into place once the bug resets the loop it has its rules they're nonsense but they do stay consistent within their own rules which is something i appreciate so it did i it's it's but i had a lot of fun with it and it's okay I, I did too and i believe it. it's like oh we have to do it within this time and then it makes sense we can't you know so they really tried to i i, I was thinking a couple of times because when the when the tiny wimey explanation jargon starts and when the engineering jargon starts mm-hmm. i kind of experience yeah. a little bit of a leaving my body moment and not like yeah. in a oh i'm having so much fun i'm leaving my body it's more like a i'm just gonna kind of pay attention right now um i love it but i usually will make this note in moments like this where i recognize that star trek has rules the writers mm-hmm. are held to a high standard so they're trying to make sure that it Generally, makes sense yep. within their canon and they're doing their best to press the limits of storytelling and doing time travel while also attempting to make some sort of sense for the the plebeians such as myself, mm-hmm. the nerds such as yourself, and everyone in between. And I gotta satisfy a lot of different people. And we've seen an episode now of Voyager where there is a this time police. Mm. So yeah. So obviously somehow this is okay. It's they're not. Well, the time police the exist. The time police exist before this episode i think they come from the 2600s or the 2500s why why wouldn't they be invested in being like you guys can't do this like there's no time police anymore i think oh really because we're in the 3200s the time police were like 25 2600s i think maybe 27 you would think that that's an important division to keep alive I mean, not when all of your dilithium has blown up and stopped. Maybe it was just too much. Maybe Kirk and Janeway just killed them all. They're oh, done. interesting. Okay, that's interesting. I kind of just assumed that it was introduced in that time and then it's just part of, they're, they're just sort of always watching kind of a vibe. Yeah. No, I, I think there's, oh, I'm not even going to try to explain that because they haven't, <laughs> they haven't, so, they haven't given us a full set of rules for this. So is time travel banned? As much as you can ban time travel, like okay. the Klingons aren't going to agree with Cause, that. Because that was mentioned also. And, I, and and that's interesting to me because that means that this weapon that Maul and Locke have is really not... I mean, can we talk about this weapon? What did you think about the whole like time travel bug thing? What? How do you feel about that as a, a way to kick this off? Because it seemed pretty unique to me. Damn it. The, 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 the writer's know exactly how to get a loophole out of me because i was like this bug is some nonsense and then they go and mention the krenum they had to mention the fucking krenum didn't they and just give me a little nerd boner that was like <laughs> oh i know who the krenum are oh the I krenum don't? are really good at time tra- so the, i'm kicking myself so much because there's a great two-parter time travel episode in voyager called the year of hell and if we hadn't just dis- hadn't if we weren't doing discovery we would have squeezed in the year of hell at some point and we will in the future but the big bad are the Krenum. the past? Stop it. The big bad for that are the Krenum. And basically this one absolutely just, just traumatized and insane alien is like, I'm going to change all of time until my family are back with me. Because his oh. family were killed as a result of a war. And so he's mastered this time ship thing that can alter technology, but alter alter the timeline and um, but when you change one thing it snowballs and changes a lot of other things so he has to fine tune this situation until his family are back but long story short that means the krenums are expert on time weapons and time travel and things oh. like that so this is a krenum time bug Ooh. technology thing so i was like yep yeah, makes sense fuck you had to pull <laughs> out the krenum didn't you well damn it there is this clever moment I think it happens a couple of times early in the episode, which I kind of enjoyed of Michael and Rainer trying to figure out what kind of fucking shenanigans they were in. And they're just like running through the list of shit, you know, and then Rainer is the one who lands on time bug. And so now we, we see, you know what it is. We see what Mm. was planted on to um, that, the character from last episode that was on trill. I can't remember their name. Uh, Adira. Okay. So, questions have been answered now it's a time bug so you really like that i thought it was kind of unique honestly i hate it 
I hate that it's a spider. I hate how it works. I hate that the ship can't discover it, but a fucking human eyeball is just like, oh, look, there's a spider crawling around engineering. Yeah. Like, what a dumb piece of espionage that gets spotted by a shitty human eyeball. It circumvents everything other than a biological squishy bag of water with shit vision. And I, it, I, I don't, it doesn't need to be a spider either just to make it creepy crawly to get around the shit. I don't like it. But then they went and called it Krenum and I'm just like, oh, okay, you got me. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's part of it is that uh, that I'm learning and thank you for kind of telling me about it is that it's created by An somebody universe who species. has been working on things like this for a long time. It's highly, yeah. It's highly specific though and definitely sinful in that it knows exactly where to go it's not detected by like you said security systems or any of this this stuff insane shield that extends the episode by 20 minutes (laughs) it does that shield man that bought us 20 minutes of runtime didn't it oh my goodness yeah Um, it really did but it looked cool (laughs) oh it looks cool i just i'm baffled by how advanced this technology is and the applications when you when you invent something like this as a catalyst for an episode you get me thinking so much about what are the other applications? Why aren't they used more? Will we ever see this thing? This thing is crippling. You beam a hundred of these onto different ships. And that's exactly what the Krenum did. They used it to cripple other ships, which is what the episode tells us. I don't know how you get around this bit of technology. This Forget the progenitor check uh, tech. We need to stop this spider bug thing it it's seems insane. though that the progenitor tech has a lot more implications of its power whereas this one's limited you know it, I, it, I mean it gets going and then it eventually wears itself out and it, it gotta, can't it can't yeah. keep itself sustained it just i know but it's still so dangerous it can I mean, alter yeah. all of time like it if, well, if not they all of had time a, it kind of pockets had, one ship yeah i don't know how that works it, it, it pocketed discovery so it was targeted on discovery so somebody would have to target yeah every single ship but you can't and- just isolate discovery it's all of the effects that discovery has on other things as well like if they go there and blow up it, it, and it must just be a branching timeline thing it's i'm not even gonna my brain just broke a bit <laughs> how this spider fucking works the spider it, it, it does it does work it works and then it stops working they figure out how yeah. to put their hand in there and do and, the and, thing you know yeah. there's so there's so much convenience like this is this is the thing about an episode like this. There's so much that you just go along with because you are having a good time. I'm sure yeah, upon absolutely. second or third watch, you're gonna feel a different tug on the time mm. of the, that you're. But at least I want it. to watch it a second and third time, which is really really fun. I, I, I would watch this again. This it has humor. We have action. We have a mystery to solve that's not what you expect. And I think this is the right time on a when you're releasing episodes, I think this is the right time to change up the format because we're expecting another clue to be discovered in this one. Mm-hmm. So to yeah. surprise your audience and not do that kind of feels nice, not going to lie, because yeah. it's like, oh, okay, we're not but doing what's But if you do expected. it, it's got to be fun. You can't make it some bullshit you, or else you just feel like you're spinning your wheels. And it, I think it really does that. It really makes it fun. And But the humor did work for me, and I felt like there was definitely one big scene where the humor hit, which is Tig, you know. Tig, that was my next question. Yeah. Tig comes back. How did you enjoy the Tig stuff? So you got these three characters. Uh, you have Rainer, who hasn't been through any of this and is learning just how much the Discovery has been through before he got there. He's mm-hmm. not reading a debrief on the bullet points. He's experiencing it. And that's another yeah. reason why I feel like the progression of this character is so powerful moving forward, because mm-hmm. we can kind of like really understand where he absorbed it from yeah but we have michael reflecting on all of her history which could be a really interesting dive into this character work and then you have this other character paul who we really don't get to see too 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 much but there is still a lot kind of happening there we have him reflecting on all of that he's been through before he was altered after he's altered the future Mm -hmm. where he's scared of what's going to happen and the pressure that he's feeling and i love in that moment too how rayner kind of shifted to let's just show what the old dogs can do he is a really good he is good he's he's got some good instincts at the very least yeah. of how to to kind of and be he's commander charismatic as heck as well he really just yeah doesn't use it yeah he in um, the way we expect but but for that tig moment like for me i'm interpreting that as paul being more exposed to all of these different 
moments in time. It's like someone yeah. flips open your diary and takes out the big hit moments. And then you're back there going, holy shit. Remember when I was this person? Mm. Remember when I would have responded this way? Like, and even as a content creator myself, the like old podcast episodes that I've been on where I would have responded very differently today than I did before. Mm. And you put yourself and you're like, oh, but this is why I would have res was responding yeah. differently. Like I'm I was very a different grumpy. person. Everyone get out of this room. Yeah, I was grumpy before the tardigrade DNA. <laughs> and he was. Like, we didn't really like Stamets in the first few episodes. He was arrogant and he was really, really mean. I love But not that. in a mean way that we kind of respected. What a what a fun and perfect way to make a wink and a nod that you yeah. have character growth, whether it's because the writers needed you to be more likable for your mm -hmm. audience or was whatever the purpose is like yeah. he and he shift and i love how uh rainer said well that got them out even faster because it's more rainer style of just being direct yeah. but then paul's response was well that's just who i was at that time but to have to kind of keep the mental gymnastics about where you mm. are in your own time period and stuff now i do have a question about the 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 people that were in the outfits like before we got we were talking about predictions and and them being a specific kind of species was that that species attacking the discovery oh, no no no, no. Okay. we it, haven't seen the breen in discovery so that just all. happened to be no, no, no. suit people right no, we talked about suit or, people orions okay. i think they were working the, the orions were doing something sketchy and trying to take the ship so yeah, I see. they okay. were just aliens in in regular i wasn't sure helmets and whatnot yes i wasn't sure and so i thought maybe good to ask yeah, good yeah, to yeah, ask yeah. now similar it's kind of like in this moment it was a few few moments after the um reno appearance um i love uh tig oh okay. her name is yeah. jet reno okay okay burnham is in the in the turbo lift the doors open and linus walks in and i'm just like oh thank goodness if it's gonna be anyone it's linus and they just have a great moment similar to like tig no nonsense just linus just moves along and does his thing and I was just like, okay, she's in the clear. And then fucking Burnham walks around the corner. Season Ooh. one Burnham. And I was like, yes, this is amazing. <laughs> I loved it so, so much. Because it's just, I love it when shit goes sideways. It was so fun. And she just like, no, 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 come back here. Pulls her into the turbo lift and they just go to town. And what I, I really, really like, this can get really sketchy when you have the same actor playing with themselves in the same scene and you have them side by side. Yeah. I thought this fight, the interaction, the CGI stuff that they had happening was so good. Yeah. Like, I didn't feel it was jarring. I didn't notice the stunt double. Maybe you went on another watch through. The only time I could kind of see it being a bit weird was when she was, after she does the neck pinch and she's holding old Burnham's head, there was a bit of weirdness there. But otherwise, I thought yeah. that scene went so, so well. I thought it looked great. Yeah, that's the only time so, that I so recognized good. that there was something a little squiffy going on was when past Burnham had passed out. Yeah. And our Burnham was kind of holding up um, their head. But I thought that it was really, really interesting um, to see the fight because for me, I am learning that past Michael is a fighter. And oh, like... Uh -huh just fiery but also even then very protective of what she had on discovery even yeah. if it was that she was maybe me versus the crew a little bit because she had to kind of prove herself and she had done this you know terrible thing uh to to really be a mutineer mm -hmm. um she's not fighting future michael because of ego it didn't seem it seemed like it was no, like it's just time you're a shapeshifter and you're going down and it yeah. was this confidence that she knew the right thing to do right then and was just jumping into a fray um mm -hmm. and it was so fun like the same on same so well vibe done. Yeah. yeah it was really well oh, done it was so good the, the way that arms... they were matching their yes! moves uh -huh. like that choreography was so because in my brain i was like this is going so fast how am i noticing this am i incredible am i just really observant and it's like no the show's just doing a really great great job at mirroring mirroring their moves and matching their technique and old burnham looks confused for a couple of seconds just like why why is this going this way like is she me like the the vulcan fighting they were doing was so well done so great and i wouldn't have really known that that was quote unquote vulcan fighting until like right now so obviously mm. she's been trained and then we get to yeah. see the vulcan neck pinch but 
I didn't really think about that it's a specific style and I didn't really need to. It's her no. style. And of course she's going oh, to it. Now so it has good. so much martial arts technique to it. Like yeah. the way that she's standing is how I was taught to stand when I studied martial arts and, and I went uh, into my dojo six days a week and I loved it. I loved it. There was just this, it's almost also like, you know yourself and mm-hmm. you know you're going to go hard because you know yourself. So future yes. Michael is going, well, this is, this is, ha- I can't, this is happening. Yeah. And I don't know was, how she's going to do this. It was really intense and I loved it. And I, yes, I wanted to see the pinch happen and it did happen, mm-hmm. but I still love the fight and it happened just long enough. It wasn't too long. Yeah, I think so. Alice is a more experienced Burnham as well. She's got a few years on young Burnham, so she's picked up a few more tricks. Yeah. I like that, but that was fun because I heard you say, oh, 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 when she enters shit. the lift before oh. it showed yes. up on my screen because you were like oh, just slightly course. ahead. So, yeah. which is exciting because I was like, ooh, what got Ian what excited? Yeah. Because, and what's really clever about Discovery at this point, because if we bump into Riker during a similar time travel episode, it can be season. Okay, if he doesn't have a beard, I know we're in season one, but from season two to seven, I'm kind of like, Oh, this could be Riker at any point. I don't really know. (laughs) But with Burnham, I know at what point in her history we're at. So I know what Burnham we're dealing with. I know what's going on with her at this point. Mainly because her hair changes every season. So I can kind of pinpoint what season we're in. So it was really interesting to see Burnham with the distinct hair she has walk around the corner in that uniform. And I'm like, oh, Oh, fuck. This is not who you need to be bumping into right now. I have to say. So good. I didn't know what was about to happen. I didn't know the intensity. I think if I were to have watched all of this and know the Michael character better, maybe like on your level or even a super fan, how it had that feeling of sometimes when you watch a movie, um, this used to happen a lot with like MCU when they first started releasing a lot of their their movies. And then they would do that little Mm. thing at the very end of the movie to wink at the next movie yeah and everyone in the audience who knew who that was knew how big of a deal a big deal it was yes the first Uh one of the times it happened at least in the theater that i was in was when we saw thanos for the first time in the Mm. in that moment and i remember people always be like oh because oh, let's go. We're seeing a you big know bad. who that is. Yeah. I had no idea who Thanos was, but I was like, oh mm-hmm. shit, something's it kind of felt like that when you reacted like you knew what was about to go down. Yes. And that's was, that's a fun yeah. feeling. And that, that and it was just so fun. That's why I love that this episode so much. Like it really pays off that kind of stuff. It was really, really fun. Yeah. On a side note, the only time in the MCU that's really happened to me was at the end of the Incredible Hulk. Because at that point I didn't that that was the second MCU movie to come out. Iron Man was the first, then The Incredible Hulk. Right. I didn't okay. know that there was going to be a shared universe. So when Incredible Hulk finishes and Robert Downey Jr. turns up in the bar to say that he's putting a team together, I was like, wait, wait, I just watched Iron Man. Wait, he was Iron Man. Oh shit, this is amazing. <laughs> so that was like how I discovered the MCU was gonna be. A thing was Iron Man turning up at the end of the Hulk. It's like, yeah, oh, so good. And the Incredible Hulk is a, is a great film and is underrated. Anyway. I just, I just feel like this episode of Discovery took us on a journey through the history of the yeah. show itself, while also without being a clip show. Yeah, without being a clip show, and I think that I think that was really clever. I wondered if we were going to be seeing them change. Like sometimes in the time travel, as we've seen in episodes, they'll change some. They'll do something that is why something happened in in the show. Let me let me try to say this a different way. Mm-hmm. So I kind of expected that maybe Michael and Rainer were going to move something on the computer and that's why in episode six of season oh, three yeah. this happened. But it turns out that the funnel just collapsed in on itself and none of it actually mattered. So it sort of yeah. didn't well, I think everything in the this is what I, I would need to rewatch the episode. I think what Stamet said is that only when the bug has time has chance to reset the jump that it locks things into place. Oh. So all of the other loops did happen. Oh. So in theory, Tig should recognize Raina now. I mean, maybe she won't because it was the heat of battle and whatnot. But in that last loop, they're able to talk to everybody. Oh, because okay. when they get to the bug and destroy it, 
nothing locks into place and nothing happens. I think that's so what Stamets said. So if that's the case, then I would, if I was going to be really like actually sending this episode, I would go back to right when that last one started and then make sure that I really understood beforehand because did does that mean that Tig should remember Rainer now? That's what I think. Unless okay. they put it down to there Just, was the ship was being invaded, she doesn't remember the random crew member that she spoke to at that point. So yeah, I, I and then there's it like it would be fun. When it, it would was, be fun if Tig just like you <laughs> when it was dry docked and there yeah. seemed two officers. Does mm-hmm. that mean that the costuming or that the their clothing would have matched that time too, or should that have clued in that person that was in the dry dock in San Francisco or whatever, wherever they were? You know, I like, mean, it those all depends. My... Like because that dry dock guy may not be Starfleet, so he might just be oh, like true. random okay. builder, and he's like, oh, some higher ups. This is just the uniform that they wear. Fine. On that point, I miss the OG Discovery uniforms so much. I love them. That sleek blue with the gold trim. And the little, like, the neck collar thing. I love that OG Discovery uniform. I love the communicators. I love the... I was so happy with the uniform and the tech that was introduced in Season 1 of Discovery. And I was so sad when it kind of all left in Season 3. Did you like those uniforms? You're a costume person. I really did. But because of all that was happening, I had so much to absorb. This Mm. particular episode is so beautiful in so, so many ways. And I kind of continue to state that in every episode so far i love the tech i love yes. going over and tapping on the screen and it's just like jittery mm-hmm. when we go to future discovery and it's all covered in dust by the way is this a, this that's got to be a sin right like is that dust there because isn't dust like skin cells and shit that's just in the air and if everyone's I mean, dead does that mean it's just their dead bodies to ash what is that yeah i think so oh okay well that's yeah. grim um well, anyway all, the, the it sets... all depends what their final moments were <laughs> and what it looked like <laughs> They're just floating. Ar- yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I guess that's the case is that they're just still in there. Maybe gross. Yeah. Anyway. Um, ugh, they never the, really left. <laughs> but the, the sets are really unique and there's something to look at in every one that I feel mm. is a clue to the timeline. Now, they do a yes, good job of absolutely. saying, oh, this is where we are. This is what's happening. And so the super fan is not only maybe seeing old set pieces and kind of recognizing them. But then, yeah, the costuming is the other it, mm-hmm. huge indicator. Costuming, hair, uh, these sort of um, examples of where we are in in the time of discovery. So I do like the costumes, but the problem for me as the new viewer is I don't know which one is supposed to be engineering and which one's an old one. and what, So they kind of all mm-hmm. just merged together in one. Yeah. And I actually don't know which uniform you're specifically talking about offhand. I think you said while you're watching, oh, it's a beautiful uniform. And I looked mm. and it sort of had it's lines this navy that went from shoulders blue one. all the way yes, down. Yes, that's so like the this, one. Ah, okay. Yes, correct. That's the, one. Yeah. that's the one that was used in season one and two. And I loved it because it actually looked like a natural progression from the Enterprise uniform which takes place before Discovery, um, into the more like kind of bold colours of the uniforms we know now. I just I think it's a beautifully designed designed uniform. Uh, there's one last thing before we go on to the sins that I would be remiss in mentioning. Um, you're not going to have any clue about this, Danae, but it's for the benefit of the listeners at home. Um, there's an ep- <laughs> so after season one of Discovery, they did this thing called Short Treks, which was a series of very short mini adventures that were all standalone individual just adventures that happened between season one and season two and one of them was called calypso and this takes place on discovery way way in the future where this random guy finds discovery talks to zora this is before we even knew zora was a thing and all that we know is that i think and i'm gonna fuck this up but i think it's the 33 or 3400s it's like way 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 in the future Mm -hmm. so we know that discovery somehow ends up way in the future and is abandoned and is lost and i was kind of wondering if this would tie into calypso because everyone wants to know is calypso what happens does discovery end up way 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 in the future and i think zora mentions that the crew is all dead we don't know how they died but we've known since season one that Zora ends up alone on Discovery. That's so Kind sad. of adrift in space and just really... And she's kind of going a bit insane and a bit loopy at this point. 
So are we going to retcon Calypso? And when they jumped into the future and everything's abandoned, I was like, oh, is this in Calypso? Like, are we finally going to have a little bit more explanation as to what happened in this short trek? But I mean, if they're going to undo that future, which is 30 years from now where everything's gone wrong with the progenitors, are they undoing Calypso as well? Oh, it's just this big unanswered question in discovery law that i'd love mm. to have an answer to at some point and i think we're gonna get it with this being the last season i i don't like the idea of just leaving it hanging of discovery ends up adrift and zora ends up alone forever never ever read what happens to arwen in lord of the ring never just be happy with the movies <laughs> because sometimes shit just gets real sad and you yeah. end up being alone for a really fucking long time and you die and you watch all of your friends die, all of your family die, all your husband, your children, and the world mm -hmm. fades away and you're still just wandering, heartbroken forever. So maybe yeah. Zara is Arwen in this world. And and if that's true, it's super tragic. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh right. I'm ho I just there's a bit of me that just wants it addressed at some point. Like well, to go specifically not into Lord of the Rings, sorry about that. Um, I <laughs> never apologize for Lord so of the Rings. Is the idea that maybe this episode did like a little wink and nod to a potential fe like to that episode, but still because in this episode they visit the future, but then they go into the past to try to mm. rectify and avoid the yeah. future, but technically that might still be like a timeline. Yeah, that it just could exists be that, out there. I mean, it so, has to be like so that's then, how branching timelines work. So then yeah. Calypso could reference that it looked in the future and it saw that future it's and one not possible this future. future yeah yeah i think so i just think it would mention anyway it's always going to be a question mark i think we're always going to want to know what exactly calypso is because we don't even get a year we just know it's a thousand years from some time and they've covered 900 of that so we don't know if this is a thousand years after that 900 years so it's it's really really yeah it's very interesting well, no matter what, it definitely has enough similarities that it seems like it would be purposeful. So It feels like it. It feels like it. Well, how many pips out of four, Ambassador? Oh, wow. Um, I hadn't thought about this yet. I want to give it four pips. I'm trying to figure out why mm -hmm. I need to come down a little bit, which is just this part of me that's like, okay, what, what would have made it even like better? It's because four pips is 100%, and it's hard to give... It's hard to say that anything is without improvement. I, I, I think I'm going to give it four pips. For what I've seen on Discovery so far, this is my favorite yeah. one. And I think as a standalone episode, it does some really interesting things where yeah. it moved quickly. It, I didn't, I never checked the time, which hasn't happened so far. This is the first time mm, I haven't looked at the clock. Yeah. So that's kind of a, you know, more important for me. Um, I like that it had action, it had humor, it told me so much about Discovery. And maybe this would be a struggle for some, but like because I don't know the history and the characters, this was a really delightful experience for me. And I think that they did yeah. it in a really unique way where it didn't feel like it was super, super cliche. I, I love also mm -hmm. the bravery of working with time travel. You know what Always. I mean? Always. Yeah. Um, it takes some guts there and they got to solve a problem where they like made made a machine and sure some of it's tropey and, and expected like of course of course she had to go to her quarters to see Booker of course you know but let's give props to what it, this show is trying to do it's trying to yeah. touch on a lot of stories and bring a lot of emotion back in and I really gained a different understanding of the show as a whole from this episode that i would be completely lacking without it and so personally for me i think i'm gonna go for pips because i had a really good time on this one and it sets up some really interesting mysteries especially with me like really wondering about rainer and that's a delight i love mm -hmm. that they put a little bug in my brain like this guy's yeah, super something weird's going on he's he's i don't think he's evil i just think he's ruthless and i think his arrogance could lead him to make some sketchy decisions and i think he's planning he's a tactician I, if there's I, one thing I we've hope. seen in every episode he is tactical so even if he doesn't know even if he doesn't have a specific plan to use burnham's code he's got it there in his artillery just in case he's got it in his toolbox this is one of those where if at the end of the season they're not doing this i would hit this episode for it and be like fuck you discovery yeah, you fucked you up do? so i'm really hoping that they're not this. because there's just enough the, just watch the lift scene again the way he's like 
thinks, Captain, when she enters in that coach, just watch it. Mm-hmm. It's creepy. Something's going but, on there. No, I agree. But he also has that delivery with a lot of people where he's I don't very, know. yeah. I no, don't know. I, I want to believe what you believe. I want to believe it. What do you think? What's your pippage? Oh, I, I'm not going to be mean. It's four pips. Like, really? Yeah, which is strange because there are episodes that would be three pips that are technically better than this. But for what it's trying to do and how it executes it, I I love this episode. And I, I think it does a great job of what it's intending to do. It puts Raina in the place it wants, it wants him to be. And I buy it. It does callbacks without being too fanservice-y or feeling lost. Like, it has a high level of difficulty and it pulls it off so i'm gonna give it extra props for that you just you've got to dig out the old discovery uniform you've got to change the sets a little bit you've got to do some makeup work by putting everybody into their hairstyles from season one detma's hair is different away shakun's hair is different you bring back arium and do all of her makeup as well there's so much that this episode pulls off in 50 minutes and it's cohesive, and it's got a fun adventure in the middle of it, and it's mostly internally consistent. I had such a great time of it. And you yeah. suckers, you do time travel, you know you're getting by default an extra pip out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really interesting too, and we didn't mention it before, so I'll mention it now too. They did a good job of also explaining the, that they're spending a, more time in each one, and like it's getting yes. bigger than yes. it's going to get. Exactly. So even, even how they explained... And that's really, really clever story. We don't want yeah. to be spending a lot of time in those time no. travel at the beginning because we're trying to like, oh, what? Come on. So it kind of goes, peep, 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 peep. Ba. Well, you it know, fixes my biggest thing with cause and effect in that mm. some of the loops seem inconsistent with how long yeah. they should be. And those loops should be exactly the same yeah. time <laughs> each time because I'm sure that's what they did. They listened to Captain's Pod and backpedaled right. and changed this episode. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for listening to the show, by the way, uh, yeah. the writers of Star Trek. You know. Yeah, we know you listen. We can't wait to get uh, you know a, a message, an email from you. Um, you it know, it won't I'll, be from the Discovery writers because I I'll, keep making mistakes. <laughs> I will. I, I'm going to make an email just for them. Yeah. Do it's it. going to be. I'm an actual writer from Star Trek, and I love you at Cinemasense.com. <laughs> That's it. You heard it here. I'm an actual writer from Star Trek, and I love what <laughs> i lost it <laughs> <laughs> amazing well with that let's head over to engineering and do some sins battle stations black alert warning warp core collapse in 10 seconds this is the part of the show where we re-engage our sin brains remind ourselves that no tv shows without sin even our beloved time-bending discovery and star trek ambassador you go first although full with a brief disclaimer we have talked a lot about some sins the, my my big sins yeah. of this episode already with the time travel yeah i don't i don't really need to spend too much time on it but i think one of the biggest sins for me on this one was the forced false tension of that final scene where they're on the bridge and we have this and I apologize. I'm going to call her the android character, even though she's cyborg. Cyborg character. Cyborg. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love how you apologized. And I figured your it excuse out. Excuse gave the real name. I, I found the word. I found the word quickly. Amazing. Um, and and the reason is because, and maybe you can explain this one way. Why didn't the cyborg just tell them to stand down? Like she was in a position of authority. She should have been like. Hey, you two, stand down. They have my permission to do the timey-wimey stuff down there in engineering. Oh, interesting. Um, Yeah, I... Oh, good point. She could have done. It just it just is weird to me that they're on the <sighs> yeah. bridge and there's this massive need and they're looking at futuristic Michael to say, have you got it figured out yet? And Michael should just say... It's a good point. I'm down... Tell them to stand down, otherwise we're fucked. And then that should have just been a chain of command situation, in my opinion. I can so. see that working on Reese. I I think that wouldn't... I'm So nothing I'm about to say undermines that sin, because it's absolutely correct. She should have tried, and she didn't even attempt to say stand down. No, and that was because confusing Burnham might have me. ignored her anyway. That's what I'm about to say, is that Burnham probably would have ignored her and said, That's what I was I'm going to follow my gut. These people are shapeshifters. I don't like it. Yeah. But it would have worked on Reese for sure. He yeah. should have followed orders. Yeah. And I understand that they wanted attention, but it was like this. It's a way to build up that kind of feeling of like, oh, the stakes are so high. But um, yeah. that was a big sin for me. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. Reese should have been like Burnham stand down. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
Yep, good one. I like that. Um, my first one was opening the episode 15 hours ago. This might be the most baffling 15 hours ago subtitle telling us when we are thing. What am I missing here? Why did that have to be fi- 15 hours ago from when? From, I, yeah, I was, well, first of all, I was from annoyed by point? that. 15 hours ago from when in the I episode? I feel like it was, it was from the end of the last episode. So it's like, we're starting immediately on this one. 15 hours earlier, this is what, this is what Locke and Maul were doing. They got the weapon and then they went to Trill and they put it. So it's showing us when they got the weapon so that they can then go to Trill and put it no, on to them. No, because, no, 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 because that, that thing isn't the weapon. Because at what? the, at, no, at the end of that speech, she says that, oh, wait, no, maybe it is. No, that's the, no, I maybe thought it that is. No, they it got is. that weapon. Because they from... said that Discovery isn't going to be on Trill for long. Right. So they are going to Trill. Yes. Okay. That's so confusing, though. They should have put that at the end of last episode. So that first scene happens before last episode. That, yes. This is the planet that they or were on that they figured out. inside that episode somewhere where they said that they've been scanning them and they haven't found them on Trill or whatever. Like, it, it's yeah, just... Yeah, that's it's, the planet that yeah. they're on. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay. I don't know why then the hours one... make sense exactly, but they yeah, got it that figured 100% out. Should, they should have put that at the end of the last episode. And that would have been a nice little tease for, wow, what's coming what's coming next? So yeah, I guess, yeah, that is been? the spider bug thing. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, Okay, absolutely. thank you, Danae. Oh, you're well, welcome. well cleared up. I like that. Uh, my next sin is you don't have to prove who you are. Just tell them to go scan the little bug in engineering. Like that tells you everything you need to know. Can, right? Why not? Why can't they? Why can't they just go down and look at it and be like, oh, oh yeah, here's the fucking it. bug yeah. that you're talking about. Do they have about. time to do that? Uh, they can beam they have down there. They can beam down there. Beam down there. Yeah, Boop. look at the spider. Yeah. Yeah, but then you don't get the emotional <laughs> I'm just, talking. I'm just make. saying that. Like, I no, understand right. that the show, and again, yeah. I gave it four pips because of mm-hmm. how I, they were forced to have conversation, and that conversation told me a lot about who the characters were at different points in time, which was delightful. Yeah. But the evidence exists throughout all timelines right there. Just yeah, fucking Yeah, it's right there. It. Yeah. yeah. It's so similar to the Voyager episode where they have that the the thing that's invisible but seven of nine can see it with oh, her eye yeah. and it's present in the same place in every single timeline like mm-hmm. I, there's lots of star trek time travel homages um in this episode i like it um my next one was i mentioned this in the episode but i really do want to hammer home how stupid it is that samitz happens to see this bug and it, it's not just that a human has been able to spot this bug the only human that is immune to time shenanigans happens to be the one human that spots the spider and can help out. Like, this this plan is excellent, and this plan should have worked. They only get foiled by Stamets being the person that spots the spider thing. And that's insane. Yeah. That is so incredibly unlikely. Yeah, It's so unlikely. And it, I actually feel bad for Locke and Moll <laughs> like just how this should have worked but didn't i am going to sin that in the future uh scenario when they are touching the dust of their dead fellows uh, mm. they really do spend a lot of time reflecting on who they were like use that time to figure yeah. out how to stop this shit and pacing wise yes we can take a beat and yes it sucks to realize that this is going to be your inevitable future but you're not there yet and you have time like you've got maybe a full minute to talk to Zara and and come up with a solution and learn more information. Yeah, but instead, use the AI while you can. She's just sort of like casually <laughs> walking up to her chair and, yeah. you know, just disrupting the death all around her. <laughs> and inhaling it. I, I just kind of was, I was almost yelling at the screen to like, do yeah, something <laughs> there's a lot of has time for this in in this episode yeah there, um, is. there was a couple where uh like burnham talk old uh our burnham talking to old burnham i was like you don't have time to be giving her words of advi- advice right now you have to get to engineering she doesn't have time to be kissing book like she what 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 she has to do when book walks into her quarters is run past and just say gotta go done that's it no apologies no don't make an excuse just say gotta go be right back stay there i'll I'll be back don't don't worry gotta go she's done weirder things than that 
Like, just, you do not have time to get sentimental with books. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Yeah, there was a lot going on in this one. Uh, I'll read one from the chat. This is Flyboy's Biggest Sin. The incredible and fortunate coincidence of the time bomb going off at the precise moment oh, that wow. Barnum and Rainer are beaming, accidentally themselves into the situation. This is what I'm saying about, like, Mock and Lowell just really getting unlucky that Stamets, Rainer, and Burnham, three people very well equipped to deal with this, are the ones that are immune to the time slippage. Makes me wonder how anyone gets out of it. There's a potential for this episode to have resolved itself with just Paul or Stamets or whatever his name is to to have solved this problem and this to have been centered around that person's personality. But I think that they knew that they needed to have some forward momentum with the characters and they well, did a yeah. really good job of like choosing to you know, make it, oh, isn't this just such a coincidence? But I have seen so many near death sort of accidental things like on um, video cameras, on security cameras, where someone just mm-hmm. happens to step to the left as a car comes careening oh by. Oh my goodness. Like, yeah. We are all accidentally still alive somehow. So maybe yeah. maybe something like this is a little bit more believable in some ways. Over the ways. course of time, the <sighs> universe is so big and time is so long so that silly. unlikely things can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my next one, this is back at the beginning of the episode again. Um, <laughs> bad guy changes the deal at the last second cliche. And asks for more money. Oh, yeah. And then when... I think I called them Mock and Lol earlier. Yeah. That's not their name. <laughs> Lock and Mol. Mol says, um, consider this an expensive lesson in how not to do business. Lessons don't usually kill you. It's not a lesson if you're dead. You don't have anything to learn from it afterwards. Yep. yep. You died. L- language is important. Um, this is so mean, but I wanted that hand injury to last. I, w- I, I wanted it- that to be... I don't think it's over. Really? Really. Oh, you think he's fucked up? Mm-hmm. Nah, he, but he flashed it to Burnham mm-hmm. and it was all healed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I hope so. So when he had his hand in there and you could see it aging and I'm like, consequences, mother front door, make this last. And then when he when they went back into the future and the his hand was fucked up, I was like, yeah, wither that thing. Give him a war wound. Like, carry that with you, sir. Yeah, but I no, they, d- it looks I, like they healed it. I think that's going to actually impact him on a, some sort of cellular level, and I think he's going to have a ticking time clock for his own death. Nice, I would. That would Prediction. be interesting. Yeah, um, interesting. Uh, there was a there was a mention of one in the in the chat earlier, and it and it was kind of similar to one that I had, which is carrying things around with them. Um, like they'll pick something up and they'll take it with them whenever, or at least I thought that they were going through time that, with items. Yeah. And I, because, mm-hmm. oh, they made, like, they made the little dealie the time bomb, bomb thing. To, yeah. To capture the spider. Yeah. And then how, how does that, it, how does that go through? And and if that's the case, and maybe it's because you're being really, really good and you're not taking things with you. I would just be grabbing stuff from each time. I'd be like, oh, I <laughs> missed that mug. I oh, my stuff. God. Yep. Oh, I love that. That plant well, was so cool. And just like, you come back to the present with just like this backpack full of shit. Stuff? Yeah. <laughs> this is where, this is where, oh, oh, I'm going to turn on that paper shredder and nobody will understand Shut why. Up. Shut up. <laughs> this is where this stuff went missing. Like, I have to pick up this stuff so I can get it back. Um, but yeah, I was kind of curious I, about that. That just seemed to be like a. Otherwise, so they would be naked. So it makes sense for me for Michael and um, Rainer. Because their uniform stayed with them. Right. It's creating a bubble around them. So I think anything they hold on to continues to be with them. Doesn't make sense for Stamets. He is inhabiting his body. He the only reason he's immune isn't because of the transporter. He's immune because of his tardigrade DNA. So it's different. So he's replacing himself at each point. So no one's noticing that he's aged. I mean, it's only like three years. How much do you age in three years? Have a kid, you'll find out. fair i don't think he's had a kid i don't think okay. he's pushed a kid out of his vagina as okay. far as i can tell i can i can have that up on wikipedia later yeah i think so did but paul have what, a vagina I, I don't necessarily think he's taking the same pad with him i think he's picking up the the uh, an existing pad on discovery and then using that to do his calculations and whatnot. okay i think that would be my my time travel logic that's interesting okay okay, okay. well as always, there's always time travel shenanigans. We'll just admit that the time travel stuff doesn't make sense and we can move along. Let's go over to the captain's ready room and do some predictions. 
Welcome to the Captain's Ready Room, where we hear our predictions for the rest of the season and bask in our queue like glory if anything we have previously predicted has come true. So, we, I don't think we touched on my prediction this week, which was completely unnecessary. Uh, we're finally going to meet the Zenkethi, and we're going to do some very elaborate dealings with the Zenkethi, and then there's going to be a betrayal of some sort because we're spinning our wheels and we're not going anywhere. We're not meeting the Zenkethi yet, and I don't think we ever will. You edging bastards. You Zenkethi yeah. edging sadists yeah no that that definitely that definitely did not happen did not come true yours did you pretty much exclusively said there will be Raina development this week between michael burnham and Raina, and yeah i got one of three well i mean predicted. i had kind of yeah. three points um mm -hmm. but i feel like that one was the i'm glad that they did we needed it to move on and now i'm really curious what next episode's gonna be because we're definitely gonna have to get back into this mystery well for sure um next episode is called and i'm i'm i'm, uh, I'm bursting because i want to predict what's going to happen mirrors what mm. happens ambassador and you have to go first because my prediction will spoil you okay well i'm wondering if there's other episodes called mirrors or something that would yes. be like uh okay. okay damn it i couldn't i couldn't hold it in wow um <laughs> um <laughs> the show is kind of asking us to reflect on whether the character development is going to warrant them finding this progenitor thing. I wonder if it's going to be like mm. a, a theme on looking in the mirror and seeing yourself and what you're out about. But having just watched this episode and having already had a big old dose of that, this one probably mm. should have been called mirrors because they're looking at themselves a lot. Um, or at least Michael is. I don't know if they're going to do that for every person. I also would challenge you because mirrors, if you would hope that they would not repeat the same theme from the same episode within themselves. So maybe it's going to, you know, your your prediction might be like, oh, it's going to be like this mirrors from this other Star Trek thing. But I don't think they would do that. I mean, I, I have lots of predictions. I said, let, let, let's just make sure in this prediction section, I'm talking about like, I definitely had some predictions this up uh, about what Rainer might be doing too. So those mm -hmm. are kind of in there, but yeah. I think those are more seasonal, maybe arc predictions for like the next episode. We're going to have yes, to get into Lock and Mall some more, I think. You would think so. So I agree with you. I, my, I'm, I'm literally split 50, 50 because my, my gut instinct prediction based on the episode title doesn't really make sense but i'm really confused as to why they've done it or why they've named it this so in the history of star trek there is the mirror universe and there are a sequence of episodes called mirror mirror in a mirror darkly through the looking mirror whatever and all of these episodes there's one in the original series there's a handful in deep space nine and they're about this mirror universe that in TOS, they accidentally, a couple of the crew members accidentally get pulled into it. In Deep Space Nine, they transport into it through this dimensional transporter. And it's this parallel universe, not a different timeline. It's a parallel universe where there's this Terran Empire and the Federation and stuff. Federation doesn't exist. Hold on. Let me get let me get my fucking chart out again. Hold on a second. Let me just get out my notebook. Okay, okay. So there's really quick, yeah. Well, there's an alternate universe where there's this other empire called the Terrans. The Terran Empire. And basically, humans are evil. The conceit is that that's normal. Humans spread through the galaxy and are evil. All of the alliances that we know are different. So I think the Klingons have teamed up with the Cardassians. Anyway, everything's sideways. Spock is evil. Um, or <gasps> kind of evil. Well, that's, I know, that's right? That's interesting. Yeah, it's very okay, 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 okay. So lots of things are different. Captain Kirk is evil in this universe. Um, Cisco's off doing things. Picard is evil. There's l everything you think you know is completely wrong. Tilly is a mass murderer in okay, this universe. Okay, hold on a second. I'm I'm catching a big theme here. Is yeah. this like everyone just turns into the ass version of opposite. themselves? They're basically the opposite of what they are in this mirror universe. Enterprise does a big thing with it as well, which is interesting. But this is a thing that pops up again and again and again. And in season one of Discovery, the big crux of that is based on the Mirror Universe as well. So I, what's baffling me is that bringing in the Mirror Universe now doesn't really make sense for what this season is doing, where we're going. But I don't know why you call the episode Mirrors and not tie it into the Mirror Universe. Oh, dear. I would be 
baffled because just call it something else because everyone is going to be expecting mirror universe because discovery is tied to the mirror universe because of season one <gasps> Ooh, i, I, I don't know i got it i got, it, I got, it, I got it. it that's what the next clue is it's in the mirror universe i hope so i actually do because i will be so confused if this has nothing to do with the mirror universe i will be baffled yeah don't call it mirrors then call it yeah reflections call it anything else don't include is, the word mirror is there a character in the star trek canon that is the same in both universes spock would be the closest so, so i said spock, spock was evil clue. yeah perhaps spock was semi-evil he was conflicted so maybe spock has the clue the clue maybe that's who burnham has to go to who knows evil burnham yeah, possible because once I would she goes it. through then she's evil which means that no Lock- no no no, no. Ooh, because oh then maul and Locke would get the clue because they're good not necessarily so oh, what the fuck? because no because you don't become evil when you visit so you're the ver- the other version of you in this oh, universe might be evil oh, oh, but you still I exist see. as you there so there's two of you then essentially. there's two of you that exist okay, there okay, okay, exactly okay. yeah it gets interesting when they switch places yeah i mean that would be really really it could be really interesting if they had yeah. to go and 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 like convince a, a character that we love so who would you like to see having the clue would it be spock or would you like to see somebody else have the clue if this is actually where it's going let's if just this pretend is, if this is what happens it now that you've said it it has to be spock like that just makes too much sense it and makes it's too played much by... sense yeah ethan peck yeah <laughs> yeah so your, your man uh-huh oh that i'm really gonna like next week there's part there's a character called Lorca that i really everybody wants to see again but he would be i think he would be our good version of our our proper version of Lorca would be in the mirror universe because the evil version of Lorca ended up in our universe but anyway that's who i would like to see that would be a great callback to season one what i would like to summarize with this is that fuck you discovery for making every episode a just carnage for me of having to in the moment google all of the shit that i've forgotten so that i can explain it and not get it wrong like this i had to go back and google like what was the red wing suit again what was the red wing suit so don't ask you just brought it up (laughs) so when burnham is like yeah that's me i'm in the red angel suit in season two spock is seeing all of these different red signals everywhere and long story short they 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 figure out that it look how burn, look how much pain you're in you've I, literally uh, drawn your head I've down a, to your toes I've, I've got a chat that's like going to be updating me as well but burnham's parents die she thinks they both die but what actually spock's happens parents. no 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 burnham's parents because burnham is adopted by spock's parents burnham's birth parents burnham's birth parents correct okay. die in a in an attack by the klingons okay her mum actually escapes because she's been working on this experimental time travel suit of course. with Section 31. Which is the bad one? Section 31 are the sketchy police sketchy for Starfleet. Federation they, police? They, they do the things that the Federation aren't allowed to do. Starfleet specifically. So they're not... Star, they're Starfleet, but they're not... Okay. Starfleet. Okay. So they're, they're, e- they're, they're not evil, but they do the things that are unethical. Okay. So they're working on this time thing because Klingons have time crystals and they're worried about a time war with the Klingons. So they want to make this time travel suit. Burnham's mum goes into the future to save herself, sees that in the future, shit's gone sideways and everybody dies. So she goes, she wants to go back in time to prevent this from happening. Okay. Spock sees these flashes of red, which is her, and okay. thinks they're these weird signals. And they are, and they track the signals. And and then they... um. <laughs> Burnham eventually works out that it's her mum that's in the time suit, goes to talk to her, finds out what the mission is. They build their own time suit. Control also wants to build a time suit. Control we mentioned last week was the super the super AI thing that wants to rule the world and, right. and, okay. and whatnot, rule okay. the universe. Okay. Okay. The only way that they can do this, the only way that can control that control can win is if they have the sphere data. So Burnham uses the time suit they build on Discovery based on her mum's time suit to open up a portal that will send Discovery to the future and take the te- take the knowledge away from control. Okay, we talked a little bit about that happening last time, yeah. but now I'm learning that it's because she turned into a red angel. Yeah, so they called it the red angel before they knew what it was because this red angel came in and like ex machina some shit. 
This was all in season two. This was the arc oh, of season two. Okay, really. you're trying to you're trying to condense an entire season. Well done. Yeah, an entire season into into one one bit. Yeah. So the Red Angel basically like Burnham was in front of Discovery and created this wormhole. They had to defend Burnham while she created this from wormhole. From who? From control. From control and oh. his min and their minions, the AI minions. But not yeah. the Klingons. I, the Klingons were there somewhere too. Yeah. Of course they were. It was a lot. That, is, Any that other sounds questions? like a lot. Yeah, that's the like, summary of the Red Angel. So, so what happened to the mom? Did she die? Uh, no, she's still alive. I think in the future. So she was tethered nine hundred years in the future, and I think she's still around. She's working with Navarre, I think. Oh, of doing course, diplomacy Navarre, stuff. A, a character no one can forget. What well, Nav- <laughs> Navarre is a is a is the conglomeration of the Romulans and the Vulcans. Oh, of course, Navarre, the <laughs> conglomeration of yeah people in the future. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's season two of Discovery, and that's <laughs> they just had to slip it in when she said, oh, "That's the Red Angel, that's me," and I'm like, "You, this had better be important." And they never come back to it, and I'm like, "I'm gonna have to explain this, but it has nothing to do with this." I'm episode. glad you brought it up because it was one of my questions that I had uh-huh. that I forgot What's about. The Red Angel. Mm-hmm. So the Red Angel is is a time travel suit, essentially. Yeah. <sighs> So yeah, next week is got to be a mirror universe episode. That's my that's my prediction, and I think you're right. That the next clue will be in the mirror universe, and they have to get it from somebody. There you go. Um, that's our predictions for next week. Thank you for joining us on this timey wimey wibbly wobbly super fun episode. I hope you enjoyed the episode of Discovery as well, and us. If you would like to message us your predictions and melt my brain, send them to captainspod at cinemasins.com. Um, on Twitter at captainspodcs or uh, X as well, whatever you want to call it nowadays, and um, to discord.gg slash cinemasins, where we have a lovely bustling Star Trek community of people talking all things Star Trek. And until then, I'm Captain Ian, and it's time to evacuate now before mushrooms grow on your lungs. <laughs> I'm waiting, Dr. Truffles. <laughs> Live long and Podspur. Thanks for listening. Want to connect with the show? Our hailing frequencies are always open through captainspod at cinemasins.com. Like, comment, and subscribe on your podcast player of choice, and be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Oh, that's that is that is disgusting. How long has that been there? Don't ask questions. Long enough for it to become a solid rather than a liquid. That's how long. That's all you need to know. I'm not too late. I'm cu- I'm currently failing to load late. Wh- why? Why is this failing to load? Oh shit. Why? Why? Why can't this be reached? What's happening with my computer? Oh no. Why don't I have the internet? <laughs> No internet? What the fuck? Okay, okay, we're not going to panic. We're just going to try to open this again and see if magically something has changed in 12 seconds. Oh, no. Is it working? Is it working? Hello. I can see you. Yay! I have internet. Uh, Well, guess what I almost didn't have? (gasps) Ooh, 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 ooh. Air. Wait, are you recording? Of course I'm recording. Okay, good. No, I definitely had air. Definitely okay, okay, had okay, air. Okay, okay, okay. Um, a car. Oh, <gasps> did someone steal your car? No, my goodness. I wouldn't be making a... No, I would be making a joke about that. Yeah, no, I would. <laughs> but I wouldn't be this calm. I think it okay. would be a, a bigger a bigger thing. Okay, okay, okay. Have I been close at all or no? No, not even close. No, not even it. a little bit. And it's weird because it's not a big leap. Not a big stretch. You almost didn't have a microphone. Nope. Although you're getting closer. That's getting better. More relevant. A, c- a computer. No. A, b- a mustache. That No, we've gone to less relevant now. <laughs> We're miles away. I give up. Um, Discovery Season 5, Episode 4 <laughs> is what I almost Why? didn't know. Why? What happened? Because, so I watch... So, long story medium, <laughs> I really wanted to be watching Star Trek on my TV downstairs and... The only way I can do that is through my Xbox that's connected to my TV. Oh, and you, but, which now has a remote that works, I, a controller that works. Yes, yeah. after last mm-hmm. week. But the previously last year or whatever, there was no Paramount Plus app on the Xbox. Nothing. Right. So the only way I could get Paramount Plus was by subscribing to it as a channel on Amazon Prime because Prime Video I can get on the Xbox. What? So I've been watching Discovery leap. Wow. via Prime. Okay. But Prime hasn't uploaded episode four in the UK yet. Oh. 
I have important. searched. I've tried live every way. <laughs> that, that's, that's where I happen to be domiciling right now. Mine was like a troubleshooting situation. I sat down and usually I just start recording and then I connect to you and it's no big deal. This time I sat down, I started recording and then nothing was working that requires oh, no. the internet. And my little internet thing was waffling between it saying that it was working and then it wasn't. So I begin to get into the the settings because this computer is hardwired Ethernet down to the router. There's no yep. Wi-Fi involved. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm hardwired yep. in. So if it says there's no internet, then I this shouldn't also have. Deal. Yeah, it, it would impact my Wi-Fi. I would do it more. So then I'm looking yeah. at my phone. My phone has Wi-Fi. So the, 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 the troubleshooting lightning fast because you know my brain is just super super high quality right Mm, tons of ram so much Mm -hmm. yes i think it has a really fast processor but a really low amount of ram yeah that's exactly it it. i think that's how my Mm -hmm. brain is as well (laughs) it's running really fast but it can't handle much at once (laughs) do you remember when we ran out of helium years ago Yes, and I have stories about this because this overlapped with my time in the greeting card industry when I ran a card shop and I would I got trained how to do balloon arches and I've never seen a demand for helium and just people going crazy because we don't have enough of this natural gas and I'm just like the big bang happened a few billion six billion years ago helium went everywhere and now there's none of it <laughs> it's just escaping our atmosphere it's wild because it's like growing up you don't realize that helium is not just something that you just get yeah we're not gonna be it's very difficult to capture helium it's it, it crazy is. that we put it in balloons for kids just for Insane. fun yeah and yeah. we sell it at party stores yeah when iris was born i think we were going to go for some helium for balloons as we were just taught that you do Mm -hmm. and there was none and and i remember researching it learning about helium wondering well if it's if it's a shortage or is it gone and then um this birthday party we got balloons and so justin went and got the helium tank it's behind me and i was remembering the shortage from years Mm -hmm. back and so I just thought I'd see, well, I guess we have found some it. more. Yeah. <laughs> we cracked open some rocks and found some, which I think is how we find it. I think there's like natural deposits in rocks and shit. I don't I don't know how helium works. It's it's a bit wacky, but then this is the top news article that popped up from NBC News here in the US. Here's a title. The US just sold its helium stockpile. And here's why the medical world is worried. So mm. on Thursday, um, in Jan- Thursday in January, uh, they sold the Federal Reserve, which was like a massive underground stockpile that was in Amarillo, Texas. I love this. <laughs> this is my Federal Reserve of helium. Everyone's just got really squeaky voices that works there. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! We're gonna have to shut the place down. We just sold all of it. Thank God, honestly. But they apparently helped to power MRI machines. Mm, okay. And so there was just this concern, like from a healthcare perspective, that's their yeah. number one concern. So there's 40 million MRI scans each year. Mm-hmm. And so that's a lot. It's a lot. Considering your population, that's a lot. You have what, like 600 million people? I don't know how, how big. Hey, Google, what's the population of the US? 333.3 million in 2022. Oh, okay. That's less than I thought. That's even less. So one in every, wait, one in every 11 people roughly was getting an MRI last year. Crazy, That's right? That's insane. Yeah. 10% of the population was MRI'd. Yeah. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> um. So then I switched over to this like howstuffworks.com about like, you know, helium. Mm. Um. It's believed that the planet's total helium supply is running dry, and if it runs out, it could spell the end of MRI testing, LCD screens, and birthday party balloons. <laughs> my point in is... Order of impor- in reverse order of importance. I'm like, oh my god, I have like gas gold behind me, and I feel you... weird using it now. But like, it's this weird is how somebody's, cheap it is. This is somebody's brain scan behind me. Yes. So the comfort I take, and I don't know if it's a comfort, but it's a comfort that I choose to take is that if it was really that low and we were really that short, certain things would have stopped. 
So we would not be using it for balloons. We There would be a banishment on that because we literally cannot justify selling it that cheap when you can sell it to hospitals and computer companies and you can sell it for way, way more. So when we stop wasting it in fucking latex balloons, mm-hmm. then I'll start to get concerned. Scientists estimate that we the current rate of global consumption... There's a supply of helium for 100 to 200 more years. Oh, shit. Now, that's the problem. (laughs) And it's only until it gets like we're five years away from running out. That's when the balloons will stop. What's strange is there's this like little blip on here and it says once the gas leaks into the atmosphere, it is light enough to escape the Earth's gravitational field. So it bleeds off into space never to return. We may run out of helium within 25 to 30 years because it's being consumed so freely. Yeah, it just there's a future without yeah, helium. So maybe There's a genuine one. Maybe there just is. sit on this tank, you know, and then they do a story about my great great grandchildren having the final tank mm-hmm. of helium in the U.S. <laughs> and they just use it to make funny voices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some my future like great 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 grandchild is like yeah. the person that they do this document on, who at the very end of the documentary yeah. like turns to the camera and just goes, and that's all there is for that. <laughs> That's that, folks. <laughs> Just so like what my happened to the last? said to name in 2024, I'm the fucker that did the last hit of helium. Ha ha. ha, ha. Worth it. <laughs> uh, Phil said, hello, Poppy. I'm going to send an A for allowing a jellyfish story to be the reason they were late last week. Yeah, actually. <gasps> what? Yeah. That was actually because that happened in the. Pro- what you don't know, not you, but the listeners at home, that happened in the middle of the email section. So it wasn't just outtakes derailing things. It was we'd already started the show. What did I do? I don't and remember. And they were just like, wow, this prediction makes me want to talk about jellyfish. And I was like, <laughs> go for it. Fuck it. I'll just, I'll put it in the outtakes. It's fine. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> Interesting question from Katra. What would a mirror universe Q be like? I don't even want to think about it. Maybe he would be benevolent, but then why would the Terrans be around? But this is always going to be the problem with Q. It's always like, what's Q doing right now? Does Q exist outside of time? Yes, in a word. So wouldn't so would they be impacted by a mirror universe? Maybe they wouldn't. Uh, well, no, but this is parallel. So we're talking about a parallel time as well. Maybe Q doesn't exist in this parallel universe. It'd be easier writing wise if that was the case. Right. <laughs> Captain Spot, star date 14, 19. Nope. Nope. Because she thought she was doing what was right. Um your computer just try to explode? Is that your paper shredder? It turned on by itself. Yeah, it's a very petty ghost. It's just setting off your paper shredder. I don't like that. I don't like that. That's just a power surge. It's fine, it happens. I don't know. No, I had to move it over to a different setting physically move a button if that fucking thing turns yeah. on again i'm shutting this shit down and i'm moving i'm moving, moving to house. Port alabama what do you mean <laughs> to the moon <laughs> there's Amazing. no ghosts on the moon right no one's died there yet Yeah, right? that's how, that's how ghosts work okay 